From the very beginning, almost every religion and ancient civilization has understood that there are at least two worlds that exist. This physical earth that we can all see around us and the celestial realms. The rishis of the Vedic era declared that these two worlds were not entirely separate, but intimately linked and even dependent on one another. Within these higher realms exist various beings or devas, each of them embody and act out different functions within this material universe. For example, Indra brings forth and holds back the reins. Agni is the god of fire, Prithvi is the deity of the earth, and Vayu is the god of the wind. The bridge between the celestial beings and us rests upon one of the oldest rituals known to man, the Yagna. In ancient times, the Yagna fire ceremony was seen as a portal a gateway through which we can invoke and satisfy the various aspects of this material universe. Life can be treacherous, there can be drought and disease, we need food and protection, couples want children, we all need a degree of wealth, and perhaps even more than this, there is the worry of what will happen to us after death. The Yagna was seen as a method to harness and control the uncertainty of life, it was looked upon as a way to ensure prosperity and success in our endeavours. The principle behind this ritual is simple. By making sacrifices, one can obtain benefits that help us move forward. The offerings which are made into the fire are transported to higher realms and are received by the different deities of nature. They then in turn grant our desires. The whole process was central to the Vedic civilization. The Samhita texts contain various hymns praising the gods and the Vedic Brahmanas describe in detail how to set up and perform the fire sacrifice. In order for the Yagna to be successful, the pronunciation of the Sanskrit and the step-by-step -step procedure needed to be meticulously enacted. The results of the ritual were not dependent on how intensely we pray, it was viewed much like a machine. If we work it in the right way by making the correct offerings and mantras, the yagna will yield what we want. Some schools of Hindu thought teach that performing the yagna to fulfil desires and material benefits is the goal of life. We are simply here to be happy and enjoy whatever results the yagna can give us. But in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna openly criticises this stance. He states in the second chapter, those who are unwise rejoice at the flowery words of the Vedas, declaring that there is nothing more than this. Such people are full of desires and have heaven for their goal. Seeking pleasure and power, they teach that performance of various rituals leads to higher rebirth. The point Krishna is making is that those of a lower level of consciousness, who think only in terms of selfish gain, use the Yajna ritual in the most limited way. They seek enjoyment in this world and in the celestial realms after death. He goes on to explain that the fire sacrifice was actually given as part of a natural cosmic process. Offerings are made which then go and appease the various gods. These deities, who personify the various elements of nature, carry out their role. The rains come, the ground becomes fertile and food is created. We all eat this food and out of gratitude, we should then carry on with the ritual. Yagna therefore is part of a cosmic chakra or cycle that has been ordained from the very beginning. And the reason why it should be done is not to fulfill vain desires, but to maintain our responsibility with nature. As Krishna states, if we accept the benefits of food without engaging in this chakra, we are like a thief stealing that which has not been earned. Our job, therefore, is to step up, engage and perform the yagna, not just for ourselves, but for everybody. In making this point, Krishna subtly expands the definition of what yagna is all about. It is not merely a fire ritual where various ingredients are offered, it is the field of all activity. In other words, the real yagna is life itself and the offerings we make are the actions we perform. Whether we are at work, with our family, or eating our food, we are constantly performing sacrifices. Just like the fire ritual can be used for selfish gain, so too our life can be used to fulfil selfish material desires. 
And just as the fire ritual can be done to maintain the cosmic cycle, so too our life can be lived selflessly for humanity. It is in this spirit that Krishna urges Arjuna to follow the example of the great personalities before him and act for the upliftment of one and all. He states, even kings such as Janaka attain perfection solely by performance of their duties. Therefore, just for the welfare of the world, you should perform your work. In the same way that King Janaka and other elevated souls who had nothing to achieve, live their life for the benefit of the world, we too need to perform the yajna of life with the same attitude. But this ritual is not only about external action, it is also an internal process. The Gita describes controlling the senses and showing restraint as a yajna. Performing pranayama or breath control is a yajna. Even studying scripture is a yajna. The point is, all spiritual practice which is geared towards elevating our state of consciousness qualifies as a form of yajna. In fact, the Gita makes clear that these kind of sacrifices which lead to spiritual realization are far superior to the sacrifice where physical offerings are made into the fire. In other words, knowing ourself is more important than pleasing the gods of nature. Having explained this, Krishna then dramatically states, Bhaktanam Yajna Tapasam, I am the supreme enjoyer of all different yajnas and austerities. Whether we see it or not, whether we believe it or not, in the depth of the fire of all these different kind of sacrifices, it is God who is receiving the offerings. Throughout the Gita, it is made clear that behind the various deities in the celestial spheres, Krishna is there supporting and empowering them to act. Even though the various hymns may be dedicated to these devas, any benefits ultimately come from him alone. But he is not only the supreme person externally, Krishna also states in chapter 8, that I, the supreme lord, am in the heart of every embodied being, and I am called Adi Yagna, the lord of the sacrifice. Whether we make offerings into the external fire, or into the internal fire, Krishna is the one who receives it. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, it describes how the young Krishna sent his friends to ask some Brahmins for food. Because of their rigid dedication to the Vedic ritual, the Brahmins deliberately did not respond to him. Their wives, however, who were full of devotion, immediately abandoned their duties to their husbands and ran to serve Krishna. The Brahmins later understood their mistake and were filled with immense regret. They realised that in their obsession with performing ritual, they had completely forgotten the real purpose of it. With remorse, they state, To hell with our high birth, our vows of celibacy and our extensive learning. To hell with our aristocratic background and our expertise in the rituals of sacrifice. These are all condemned because we did not respond to the Supreme Lord. While we all have the choice to use life and ritual for personal gain, the highest intention is to please God and strengthen our relationship with him. But given that there are so many kinds of yajna that we can perform, is there a particular one that lies above the others? In chapter 10 of the Gita, Krishna states, that of all the yajnas, I am the japa yajna. Japa means the continuous chanting of mantra. In Hinduism, God can take many forms. He can be the great Lord who dwells in the highest heaven. He can incarnate into this world, he can be found in the temple, and he can also be contacted through his divine name. The sound vibration of this mantra carries within it the full immensity of God. The Japa Yajna, therefore, is the easiest and most direct way to the realization of the divine. The Vedas, the Gita, and the Puranas show a progressive understanding of what Yajna is really about. It begins as a specific fire ritual designed to survive and thrive with nature. It is then expanded as representing all action that we perform in life. It also becomes an internal process of gaining realisation. And finally, we are taught that its ultimate purpose is to know God. The most ancient of Vedic hymns, the Purusha Suktam, illustrates how creation itself happened through the first ever sacrifice. It describes how God, the Supreme Person offered himself into the fire. From different parts of his body sprung all of creation. 
the planets and all the material elements were born. The gods, humanity, and all kinds of animals came from him. The hymn shows us that all of life has come about because of God offering himself as a sacrifice. Everything we see and experience has been gifted to us through his cosmic body. The Purusha Sukta makes us aware of the sacredness of all existence and that life cannot be taken for granted. Just as God unconditionally offered himself into the cosmic yajna, we too need to offer ourselves into the yajna of life. We need to realize that our time, money, talent and knowledge are not our own. They belong to God. We need to therefore strive and make everything we do an offering to him. Our life needs to be one of selfless service to humanity and the Supreme Lord. This is the highest way to live. It is the real sacrifice and the true meaning of Yajna. Many thanks for listening.